G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a fairly complex tutorial on quite an interesting topic that I presented recently at the KPF Tech Week. Now there's actually a few steps involved in the process I'm going to show you today which is how to get a solar study in Grasshopper using Rhino inside to send results back to a Revit model that are meaningful. There's a few steps before I've actually created the model that I'm using in Rhino and I'll make this model available on my GitHub. Um, but in this case you're firstly going to need to have run through a few tutorials I've already done to understand the full process. First of all, I've got a tutorial where I show you how you can take Rhino elements um, from Revit and essentially pass data across to them and put them on the right layers. This will be quite important to make sure that your model is able to be filtered. And I've got another tutorial where I show you how you can isolate and select elements in Rhino. Um, in this case, I've used it to delete some windows and delete some glazed elements so that light can pass through them in the study. After that, we also need to look at processing the rooms uh, that we're gonna use in the study, which I have another tutorial for. And finally, a second one where I also show you how you can clean up the rooms to make sure that Ladybug samples those floors evenly. In this case, I'm gonna be sampling on a half meter by half meter basis. So in this case, um, we're at the final step, which is complex. Um, in this case, you're going to obviously need Ladybug. I'm gonna be using the legacy Ladybug in this case because I know a lot of people are still using it because it's got slightly more features than the new one. Um, and I'm also gonna be using the lunchbox package and a little bit of the Elephant package as well. Anyway, um, I'll be using Revit 2020 and Rhino 7. And just a reminder, I'll be using the basic sample project remake that can be found on my website at www.bimguru.com.au um, for free if you apply the promotional code that's in the description of the model. Anyway, let's jump straight in. Okay, um, so here we are in our Revit model and I've booted up uh, Rhino Inside and also Grasshopper in uh, Rhino Inside. So in this case, um, I've got my Revit model and we're gonna be dealing specifically with these analysis rooms that we created in previous tutorials. Um, in this case, you may recall that these also contain data and their name is also the ID of the room over in Revit. And this is how we're gonna connect these two elements together in principle. So these elements will be aware of each other and we can send the results back per mesh uh, to the room with the same ID. So we're gonna begin by collecting all the layers. I'm just gonna use a node from the lunchbox called layer information. And I'm just doing this to connect all the layer names. And I'm gonna get a false start toggle, uh, just so that when I open the script, it doesn't run straight away. But I'm gonna set it to true. And then in this case, gonna be using a value set picker. Now it's important to note that this component is unique to Rhino inside. Um, it's not available by default. In my opinion, it should just be in Rhino. It's a really useful node. I'm gonna connect two of them in this case. And one of them is gonna be collecting my context. The other one is gonna be collecting what I'm testing. So um, in this case, I'm gonna select pretty much nearly everything except for my analysis rooms. Um, I may need to potentially hold down control when I do that. And I'm not gonna test my rooms either. And then for the opposite, I'm just gonna connect my analysis rooms. But the great thing about a filter mask is that if you have a different setup, so maybe you're running a script in a model with slightly different layer names, it doesn't matter, you can still collect them. So in this case now, we are gonna reference our layers. Um, so I am in this case gonna use the layer reference node. And first of all, I'm gonna go and reference all of my context with this layer. I'm also gonna get another false start toggle. And I'm gonna be using this firstly just to trigger the collection of this geometry because this is going to go and get all the geometry on those layers um, so in this case we have quite a lot of geometry that i'm just going to flatten into a single list and i'm going to be doing the same with my analysis geometry as well um, so in this case i'll set this to true so i now have the geometry for my rooms as well and with this we're going to do a few things so first of all i'm going to be using the elements id um, so in this case, it's not actually the ID in Rhino, it's the name of the element. So I'm gonna convert this to text so I can compare it. And with this, um, I'm gonna create a set. So I'm gonna create a set. And this is mainly just so I can look at the members of that set. And I'm gonna be finding similar, and I'm gonna be comparing this to all the rooms back in Revit by their ID. So I do need to go just back a step. And I'm gonna to go to the Rhino inside Revit tab now and actually go and add some, some nodes. First of all, I'm probably just gonna reference a layer by name. So in this case, I'm gonna query categories and I'm gonna just be querying the name of rooms. And this should always reliably just grab the room category without me needing to pick it. Um, from there, I'm gonna be building a filter by category just to get all my rooms. And then finally, I'm gonna query the elements in my model. I'm gonna remove the limit because sometimes that can suppress the number of elements that you'll collect. 
Um, and then I'm going to get their parameter value for their ID. So I'm going to take those elements and I'm going to call on the parameter key ID um, with a capital I. And now I should have all the IDs of those elements as well as the elements themselves. I'm going to convert the ID to text just to make sure that it's uh, comparable. And I'm essentially going to be using a find similar. So I'll just put this over here. So I'm going to find similar, similar member. And this will allow me to find the index that this occurs at. So from, in this case, going to be comparing the set to search as my geometry. And I'm going to find where that occurs in my room list. And now I'll have the indices of the geometry that corresponds to that room. So what I'm going to do is just move that down a little bit. And I'm going to call on the list item from my geometry. So from here, and we know we've got one mesh per room, so we should have an equal number. Um, we're going to call on that index. And now this will be in the same order. So when we go to set the values back at the end, um, our rooms will be sitting in the same structure. Now, as I go, I might start just cleaning up some previews just to make sure that we're not previewing too much at once. Um, I think in this case, this might need to be hidden as well. Um, but now we can essentially proceed forward uh, into a ladybug study um, because we have our geometry and also our context geometry. Now we need to actually go and build a ladybug study itself. So in this case, I might just uh, move this down a bit and we're going to go to ladybug. Um, I forget, always forget which L that is. There we go. So we do need the, the legacy ladybug in this case. So I'm just going to run in this case, ladybug, ladybug component, which will run ladybug. Um, and then in this case, going to need a few things. So first of all, I'm going to need to import an EPW file. Um, so I'm just going to use the import EPW. I'm going to get a file path. And in this case, uh, I think I just saw it. There it is. Um, so we're going to go and retrieve our EPW weather file. Um, if you don't know how to retrieve them, um, they're just on the Energy Plus website. Uh, in my case, I just keep some in a constant location. So I believe under uh, somewhere in here, um, sun error analysis. Nope. I thought I did have them in a consistent place, uh, which is surprising. I'm surely not dumping them somewhere. <laughs> In this case, I might just go to a place I know that I definitely have one, which is in a presentation that I ran. Um, so you'll just need to have somewhere at least that's consistent. I, I might have moved my weather file by accident. But there we go. So now I've got my EPW file and I've got my location data. Um, all I really need from that is the location itself. Because what I'm going to do is construct a sun path. And this just needs that location. Now you need to make sure you do get the right uh, version. In this case, I'm going to make sure I'm using the uh, legacy version. And I'll just plug that in there. Um, it's also going to expect a few more things. So five more values to unpack. Interesting. Um, I think it needs more values. So in this case, it does need a analysis period. Um, I think uh, I think in this case, I used the, the wrong import EPW as well. So I need to make sure that I'm actually um, using the, the legacy version. That's probably why. And now that should work because they must have added some more features. Okay, um, I need to construct an analysis period now. So in this case, um, I should be able to find this uh, somewhere around here. Um, I don't believe it's that one. Analyze weather, ladybug analysis period. So in this case, I need to connect this to the analysis period itself. And I'm just gonna pick a single uh, time range in this case on a particular day. Um, I probably should have specified my hours before I plug that in. I'm not quite sure how much of an analysis period is there by default. Um, really wish there wasn't one by default. Um, what I might do is just freeze my script while I do this because it seems like it's gonna not gonna have fun. <sighs> it's the only problem with Ladybug and Grasshopper sometimes running all the time isn't helpful. Okay, uh, lock. So now nothing is running. Um, I'm just gonna go and make some sliders. So I need a number slider. And I'm just gonna feed these in to the from month. And in this case, I need this to go from, actually I might just build them manually. I'm just gonna go from one to at six to 12. So this is six upon a range of one to 12. And I'm just gonna make my from month and my two month the same. Uh, for my two from day, I'm just gonna make it go from one to 31. In this case, I'm just gonna set it to the 22nd from day to day. And for the hour, I'm gonna make two separate sliders. So I'm gonna go from one to to nine um, to a maximum of 23. And I'm just gonna make that my from hour. 
and then my two hour, I'm going to go till three o'clock. This is a pretty standard um, analysis period for, for where I live in Sydney. Um, but at this point, we should be able to just unlock the canvas and now we should be extracting a range of sun vectors, which is great. Um, we're also going to need a time step eventually as well. So in this case, um, I'm just going to go and pick a time step. I'm just going to set my time step to four so that we get four vectors per hour. And I'm just going to connect, connect that to my time step. And we should find that now we get a set of vectors. In this case, 24 of them. Um, so four times six hours. Um, so that should be fine to proceed with. Um, so for now, we'll just leave that. Uh, now we're going to move on and actually build our ladybug study itself. So we need the sunlight hour analysis node and this will run our sun study. So let's go and just move these components over here. Um, so it's obviously a ladybug study. It takes a while to build. Um, in this case, I'm going to get a false start toggle and I'm going to set this to basically run parallel and run it. So essentially it's going to tell my, my study to be running in parallel processing. Um, I'm also going to take my geometry, which is what I'm testing uh, from down here. And I'm going to take my context uh, from here. Uh, at this point, the grid size doesn't really matter uh, because in this case, uh, we've essentially dictated the grid size in our mesh reconstruction. I'm just going to say uh, one and I'm just going to move it one meter from the base. So it's offset up by one meter. In previous tutorials, we showed how you can make sure the normals are always pointing up as well, um, because sometimes if you're not careful, the normals might point down. I'm now going to get my sun vectors from my study and I'm going to get my time step from back here. So at this point, we have a study um, that essentially should be able to be run. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is also obtain the Project North uh, from Revit, because at the moment in my model, um, North isn't necessarily Project North. So if I go to my site plan um, and I change my orientation, so I might just quickly set my view template to none and I change my orientation to True North, you'll see that it actually is at an angle. Um, so we do need to feed this into our North angle as well. So in this case, in Rhino Inside, there's actually a node for this. Um, so I think it's under Document Project Location. And this will give you um, lots of information, such as the location, but also the survey point, um, the project base point, and in this case, the shared site. So I'm going to be getting uh, a parameter from the actual project base point. In this case, uh, I'm going to get element parameter. If you're ever unsure what parameters an element actually has available, there's a node for it called element parameters. This is actually how I found the names of the parameters available. And I can see there's a parameter for angle to true north. So I'm just going to type that in, angle to true north, just making sure you get the capital letters in the right spots. And we should have in this case an angle in degrees, which we do. So we've picked up the 325 degrees and I'll make that my north. So there we go. So at this point we need to run our study and then we're going to deconstruct the analysis mesh to find how many um, compliant cells in each room uh, exist. And that's a fairly hard step. So that's going to take a little while. So bear with me. We've still got a fair way to go. Um, I'm going to run my study and it shouldn't take too long. What I might do um, after I run it too, I might turn off my preview um, in Revit just because sometimes it can get a little bit heavy um, having to see that preview. But at this point, um, we should have at least a analysis mesh available. So if I turn off all my elements, um, there we go. We can see that we're getting uh, we're getting most of our analysis meshes. It seems like there's a couple that we're not seeing. I think in this case, I may have actually misbaked a couple of my rooms originally. Um, so I think I might have accidentally left on, yeah, I left on areas and volumes. But the great thing about this is the way I've built my scripts, um, and I will make them all available in the data set for this, is that I can rebake these rooms and use them again. So what I'm going to do is just uh, probably going to close this script and I'll reopen it. But I'm going to go back to the script where I rebake my rooms. Um, actually, the ones where I bake my rooms first. So in this case, because I've used um, Elefront, I should be able to rebake my rooms. But in this case, um, it appears I'm not sure if this is quite going to give me what I want. No, it's not quite going to give me what I want, which is interesting. Very interesting. So in this case, I'm getting a little bit of inconsistent behavior in the way the rooms are being picked up, which is a little bit frustrating. Areas only. Very interesting. Um, I'll try baking them anyway and see what happens. No, so it's not quite what I want, actually. I'll just check that the rooms are on. Yeah, so in this case, actually, I'm getting a little bit of an inconsistent result. 
Um, what I might quickly do is just close down, close down the whole session and reopen it just to see if um, if I can get those those rooms to refresh because at the moment they look like they've been limited and sort of messed up by um, in this case the areas and volume setting because that really does confuse um, some of the algorithms that I've developed in previous tutorials. Um, so I think I might have accidentally left that setting off. Um, that is one of the challenges when you're dealing with Revit and Rhino inside. Sometimes there's a lot of quirks and behaviors to learn about the software um, that can cause problems like that to occur. And it also becomes problematic when you're trying to get a user to, to use this workflow. And if they miss out one crucial step, the whole thing fails. It's one of the challenges with um, with computation in general that you know you do need the user to have at least some level of expertise in computation to be able to do it. Um, it's, it's hard to just give someone with no understanding of what's going on um, full control. Okay, so let's try that again. I'm just gonna go make sure that my room settings are consistent. Great, I'll make sure my units are working as well. So my project units should be in meters, which they are. And now I'm just gonna go and boot up Rhino Inside again. Okay, auto. You might've noticed that auto Rhino Inside constantly tries to update itself. Um, software as a service, gotta love it. Not really. <laughs> Enscape trying to get updated as well. Enscape's just been released on version three and I don't wanna update it because all the assets don't scale properly anymore. <laughs> they fixed the issue for all the new users and they broke it for everyone else. Um, anyway. So if I just reopen my previous model, um, which I should still have access to, let's try um, let's try this again. So hopefully now it's going to read the rooms properly. Um, if it doesn't, then uh oh, no, nope, it's still not working. Very interesting. Because uh, I'm I'm dealing with the process of the rooms. Okay, that's why. So actually, I need to rebuild the rooms first. So in this case, um, I have a, a script that passes the rooms and now it should hopefully, yeah, so there we go. Now it's finding the rooms properly and I can just rebake them. And that's when it updated the whole set of rooms because I used a bake set or a bake name in Rhino in um, Elefront originally. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm gonna process the rooms and this should now have updated the analysis rooms as well. Yep, excellent. So now we have a complete set of geometry to deal with. So I'm gonna go back to my main script and we'll just run to the point where we're at so in this case, uh, we'll just go back and collect our layers, collect our geometry, and uh, collect our geometry. I might just actually connect these to the same false start toggle, just so we collect all our geometry at once. And then I'll just rerun my study. But hopefully at that point, we should um, have a complete set of rooms to analyze. There we go, perfect, so we do. So I might just turn off my location because that actually shows the markers for them as well and I don't really want to see them. So there we go. So now we can see we've got a full set of data. I'm just going to turn off the preview for my sun path um, so I just see my results. Now in this case, we need to process these results and this is actually quite complex. So we're going to be taking advantage of the analysis mesh itself. Um, I'm going to make it so it's optional if you want to see the analysis mesh. So what I'm going to do is turn off the preview for it and I'm going to build a gate. I'm going to put a false start toggle in here and I'm just going to connect that to the gate. And on gate zero, I'm going to feed nothing. And on gate one, I'm instead going to feed um, the sunlight analysis mesh to the sunlight hour mesh. And as a result, when I run it, you can see it. When I don't, you can't. I find this is a really helpful way just to control how much your script shows you. So for now, I'm just going to keep this out of the way and I might just leave it on for now. So what we need to do is deconstruct our analysis results and also compare this against the mesh itself. But I'm going to have to firstly get the face boundaries of the actual mesh. Um, and I'll show you why shortly. So if I get my sunlight hour mesh, notice that all the faces are just in one big list. So this isn't actually going to work for us. We actually need to deconstruct this. Now, luckily the results are in the order of the mesh faces. So what I can do is just check the, uh, the list length of the um, analysis results. So in this case, you can see they're broken into sublists. So what I'll do is I'll just run this. Um, I'm gonna count how many things are in each list in this case and just flatten them. And I can use this to petition the main list. So I'm gonna run a petition, uh, list petition. And to the face, the face boundaries, I'm gonna run that. So now my face boundaries should be matching, matching the, the length of um, each of the results. So now we have the results by face, uh, by mesh, which is really important because what I'm gonna do is just set a criteria here 
I'm going to just say uh, for each sample, uh, which ones have a result that's larger than a particular threshold. I'm going to say in this case, the rooms need to have uh, at least uh, two hours of sunlight to be valid. So I'm going to take my sunlight hour results and I'm just going to say that they need to be more than, and I'll make a slider from zero to two to seven. And I'm going to say they must be more than two. It's going to keep the list in the same structure, which is great because that means we can just dispatch across the lists. We could also cull. Um, it's up to you how you deal with it. Um, in one version of my script, I actually do actually graphically show the, the good and the bad faces. In this one, I'll just show the good ones. So in this case, I'm going to dispatch my list by my pattern. So it has to be greater than, or actually I'll do, or equal to. And as a result, we'll end up with two pathways out of here. So in this case, I'm probably just going to turn off my results mesh for now. What I'll do is um, I'll just quickly show you uh, with a custom preview what we've got. So in list A, we've got the patches that actually succeeded. And in list B, we've got the patches that didn't. So we can now isolate these to really process per room how many, uh, how many square meters of good result we ended up with. Um, what I'm gonna do is probably just keep a custom preview on each of these with a swatch so I can just see visually what's going on. So for the non-compliant, I'll make them blue. And for the compliant, I'll make them green. And I might also convert these to surfaces as well. So I could actually just make them surfaces here, um, which probably isn't very computationally efficient, but I could also just make them surfaces at the end as well. But at least now we can really see what we're dealing with in this case. Um, I can also just flatten the input here. So there we go. Now we can really see the difference between where we are getting results and where we're not. Um, but what we're gonna do with these surfaces is we're gonna measure the area and again, remember this is in the order of the meshes. Um, so even if a mesh has no area available, it's still gonna have an empty list, which is great because we're still staying in the order of the rooms. I'm then gonna do a mass addition and I'm just gonna combine the total area. Um, and I'm in this case, just going to flatten the output. And now I should have some nulls if I have zero square meters. So I do need to process these nulls out. Um, I'm just gonna replace the nulls in this case. And of course, as you can guess, I'm gonna replace them with zero. So I now have a workable list. And this is essentially the data that we want to send back to Revit. <clears throat> so we have 30 rooms, 30 results, um, and now we wanna send it back. But the first thing we need to do is actually create a parameter to send the data back to. So in this case, I'm just gonna create a length parameter. It doesn't really matter what format of parameter you use though. What matters is that you can at least um, include it in something like a color scheme so you can show the data. I'm gonna add a project parameter. Um, I might actually just create a project parameter and just call this sun hours. And I'm gonna make this a number parameter. You could call it sun area actually, um, cause I guess we're really dealing with an area in this case. Um, we'll say it can vary by group instance and we're just applying it to rooms in this case. Okay, so now um, we may need to potentially recompute our grasshopper script so that it now has visibility of this newly created parameter. Um, but the last thing we're going to do is just set that parameter value. So in this case, um, I'll just get Grasshopper back up on the screen. And we're going to be using a node from Rhino inside called element set parameter. And I'm going to make sure that it doesn't always send through the data. Um, so in this case, I'm going to be using, again, a stream filter. They're really good for blocking data from always traveling. And I'm just in this case going to connect it to a button. And then in this case on zero, it's gonna send nothing. On one, it's gonna send the actual data. And I'm gonna connect this to, in this case, uh, actually I could, I could do it a few ways. Um, what I might do instead is just send through uh, the name of the parameter, sun area. Um, that way it's not always gonna try and run because it can technically run if it doesn't have um, values. So I'm just gonna send that instead. The, the key is important. So my elements are gonna be back here. They're gonna be my original rooms that I collected. So I should be able to find in this case, uh, those rooms elements. And then the values in this case are gonna be my results. And then when I run this, we should hopefully see these results come through to Revit. But first let's set up a color scheme to communicate these results meaningfully. So in this case, in my view template, I'm gonna create a color scheme. Um, I'm just gonna make it based on the sun area parameter. So I'll just call this sun area. 
and I'll pick my sun area field. Um, currently there's no values, but I'm gonna do it by range. And I'm just gonna say that if it's at least 0.01 square meters, so more than zero, um, I'll just say that it's gonna be a color. And if it's not, it's gonna be gray. So now we'll be able to see any rooms that get at least two hours of sunlight, um, more than just the tiniest little area. Okay, um, so at the moment we shouldn't expect to see any results because currently there's no data um, in these fields. I'm just going to make sure the same template is on my other floor plan. And now let's run our script. And we should now see that we've seen the compliant rooms have been highlighted because they now have that value. Um, if I check out this corridor, for example, I can see that in this case my sun area parameter contains the data from Rhino, which is really cool. So we've effectively connected um, the environment of Ladybug and Revit together using Rhino inside and so a few steps to get there, obviously. So this is obviously a pretty complex workflow. This could all be packaged into scripts. Um, I'm gonna put some cleaner versions of these scripts on my GitHub for you to use. And hopefully you find this a useful way to learn more about Rhino inside, um, but there we go. So there we go, quite a um, complex script, uh, quite a lot to go through, um, but hopefully that was quite insightful to show you not only how to run a ladybug study, uh, but how to process the data so that you can send it back to the Revit model in a meaningful format. I hope you found this useful and that you can find uses for it on your own projects, especially if you've been struggling to find a good solution for running environmental analysis in Revit, which is quite a common problem because in my opinion, the Insight Toolbox just isn't up to scratch. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so. Um, I make videos two times a week and aim to do so for the indefinite future and I'll see you in future videos. Thanks. Take care. Bye.